Lake High Marsh, or its traditional name Guru, is really significant to the area, not only as the largest freshwater lake in Victoria, but also its significance in the story, the creation story for local Aboriginal people. And, and even wider than that, because it is part of a story that crosses several different language groups. And the lake was created by the kangaroo, who stopped and grazed, and thereby creating the big open patch. Uh, out, out on your country, and that's one thing I love about it, and I sort of to show our future generations what you know what was out here and where the Aboriginal people lived and how they lived and that. So, yeah. Lake High Marsh is actually part of a, a trading route, um, which went all the way up to Lake Tyrrell, and we know that because of ethnographic evidence, but also through the archaeology that we found. For example, the artefacts that we find out at these places. Um, are not necessarily from around there, which then shows that these groups traded widely. My name's uh, Ben Muir. Um, I'm a Wachabolli Yorta Yorta person. Um, I uh, am a cultural heritage surveyor, which I come out and do all the uh, surveys around the Wimmera Mallee. Uh, my name's Abby Cooper. I'm a Horsham-based archaeologist mm -hmm. and historian, and I have a business called Walkabout Cultural Heritage Management. Uh, and my main source of work is undertaking cultural heritage management plans uh, and a lot of that work is, is from um, the Wimmera in Western Victoria. So here today um, we've got two representatives, field workers from um, Brenjigadjan Land Council. We've got Ben Muir and Sandra Knight and they've both done Certificate 4 in Cultural Heritage Management through La Trobe University and so they're, they're quite skilled at identifying artefacts and I've also got another archaeologist, and he's uh, just graduating from Flinders University. So, yeah, they're basically all sieving at the moment, but uh, they're all highly trained in artefact identification and, and um, archaeological practices. Well, hi everyone, my name's Frank Bolden, I'm from Adelaide, and I'm here helping with the project um, out here on the edge of Lake Hindmarsh. And I study archaeology over in Adelaide and work with Abby Cooper. Um, yeah, it's really been exciting to be out here all week in, in this beautiful environment and working with traditional owners on such a nice place. Well, it feels fantastic mainly because I'm working with people that have the heritage here and seeing them um, discover a bit more of the story of that. Um, it's always nice to see, to see members of the community come out and be passionate about discovering their history and heritage. And we can see um, Sandra and Benno are extremely passionate about their heritage and through talking to them this week I've seen that they love to share it with the community and through their courses and uh, they're passing it on through to their next generation too. So that's fantastic to see. So one of the other really fantastic things about our work is being out on country with traditional owners and a lot of our stuff is um, through written reports and textbooks and things like that. But oral history, there's still so much oral history that's around and also learning about their connection to country which is quite different to ours and often the way that they see the landscape and pick up on little things that we walk over, even as trained archaeologists. Uh, so that's one of the really amazing things and it's something that I always endeavour to include in the reports. It's very, very um, important to share those people's oral history as well because that's what's been handed down and through the generations and uh, it doesn't all just come out of textbooks. Yeah, um, I love it. You know, it's uh, my, my passion and uh, my history and um, I love working for my people and that's all what, what I've always wanted to do. We're doing excavations, some test pits uh, for an extension of a sand mine. And what we were doing is looking for artefacts um, subsurface. Uh, so we dug down about 2.8 metres and that's the depth that was down to the natural ground surface. So we were just making sure that any sand that they did extract was not uh, going to interfere with anything such as large artefact scatters, shell midden sites, um, even burials. Uh, burials are quite frequent in that landscape out there too. So far out here we've found, um, at Lake Hine Marsh, we've found a grinding stone which is um, an, an actual grinding stone, which is actually for 
making to use ochre or crush up our, you know, food or something, you know, back in, back in our days. That's what our people used to use was the grinding stone. That's inland flint, this one, and um, this has been brought in from, we think, the Grampians. So if you can see that flint there, this is like a scraper it was. So what they used to do was um, chip uh, bits of, like, flint off, a big rock, sort of like this. And what they used to do with the, it was chip bits off like that and use it. And then little bits of this would go off to, for a scraper for a tool as well. So we'd use that to make our spears or our uh, boomerangs or whatever tools we used to use for uh, like a, uh, out in the bush and that. So that's the inland flint, what we found out here. And another one we've got here is a flake bone, which is, um, this is one of the probably the best we could find around here um, at the time. So. Um, yeah, that, this is another thing as well, so that's a very, like, like I said, with this, with the grinding stone, this is like gold to us as well, you know, and very important to us it was, and, you know, you can see, as you can see, where, where the hitting points are, where they used to hit the um, actual stone, and flakes used to come off from that, and so that would be your outside of your, your rock, and that would be your inside, and that bit there, be a scraper as well so we use these for our scrapers as well so and one other thing that we've got as well is um, a quartz quartz we used to trade from like for our for food and sources and that and that's a quartz flake there as well so that's a, another very important thing to our, our culture as well and future generations will find out and know what um, you know these artifacts and that will will be in uh, future years so yeah thank you <laughs> I think as we know the uh, the sort of changes that it's been through and to think about the the ways that it sustained people and um, and we're able to live out here um, and then we see the changes today and it just makes this um, a fascinating area to, to really, the archaeology can really reveal um, what people were doing out here, the occupation. Yeah. There was a, a large survey done um, across Victoria um, called the Victorian Archaeological Survey. That was conducted in 1979. That was the last time um, this area and Outlet Creek and Albuquerque was really surveyed. Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of opportunity around here. We know of a lot of sites around the lake bed and this is a new sort of study area that we're exploring here. Um, there's lots of scarred trees and um, scatter sites where we can see occupation. So there's a high potential for, for finding things here too. There's even the need to go and inspect them, inspect the condition of them. Are they still there? The trail bike riders are creating a lot of damage, um, which was evident when we did drive along the eastern track of Outlet Creek. For example, on the banks, the dry banks, um, it's very sandy. Um, you can see they've, they've ridden their bikes up and down, and there's some large trees that are just on those embankments that will eventually fall in, um, and also natural occurrences like fire and things like that. But it, it really is important to go out and document these things. Around here is really significant for our culture and that because, you know, we, we see the scarred trees, we find the, you know, the artefacts and all that. And we know that they lived, that our people lived out here and, you know, used the tool, tools and all that. And, you know, uh, we know that it was really, you know, significant out here to our people. It's just about protecting those sites because they are rapidly diminishing. Um, and yeah, just creating awareness about that the, our purpose is not to ever stop development or people's activities. Um, it's just to really, you know, protect it. Um, and we find ways to work around that. I think it's so important to improve knowledge about native title and cultural heritage. And also, I think edu more education could be done in schools. There's a lot of romanticism about archaeology and that archaeologists generally go over to, you know, Greece and places like that. 
um, and study ancient, ancient, what is considered ancient archaeology. However, we have evidence here in Australia that we have some of the oldest material culture in the world. Now we can, with great deal of um, surety, say that we have material dating back 55,000 years, which compared to something that's 2,000 years old being recovered in Rome um, is pretty amazing. So it's something definitely that's underestimated and it's right just here on our doorstep. You know, funding cuts has not allowed us to go out there and, and do that. And uh, I think there's lots of potential to greater inform people about that, but also create pride with local communities, understanding that they do live amongst places that have such unique cultural and heritage values, uh, environmental values, um, and also, you know, scientific. So it's really, really vital that more work is done in this area because it really is a way that we can bring lots of people together and uh, also teach the younger educations about respecting country. And once you get out there and explain to people what you find and, and how it was used, it sort of resonates a bit about the importance of it makes people, you know, think a little bit more about the way that they treat country and uh, their level of respect for it. We go out and say, say to someone, oh, I've been out to do a survey. I say, oh, where you been, where you been? And I say, oh, we've been out Lake High Marsh or, you know, out Lake Albacatra or somewhere or maybe even the, the Grampians. We do a lot of surveying the Grampians too, so. But out here is really dry and all that, but it's really important to our community because we've got to keep it alive in our community and if we don't, well, it's just going to die and um, our kids are, are never going to see the way that we lived uh, back in the thousands of years ago so and that's what we need to do is keep our culture alive in schools and in uh, workforce as well so you know that's that's really important to us as well so yeah so this is the scarred tree that we found out um, on the banks of outlet creek just towards the road that you come out of to go to rainbow this one here is a scar. The size of it indicates that it was possibly uh, used, the wood was removed to make a shield or something of that kind. And what we can see is some stone axe marks up on the top right hand side. And this is really unique because there's not that many scarred trees now that have stone axe marks. So this tree is really special. It's also quite unique as well because it also tells us that it was used in European times, the large scar on the, the other side of the tree uh, was possibly removed to make bark for a bark hut and this has evidence of steel axe marks down the bottom left corner. So this tree is really important. It may possibly contain two scars from two different eras or it may just be the presence of the use of a steel axe in times when also that people were utilising stone axes. So this tree in particular, it was unregistered just in the process of registering it and it will then be protected under the Aboriginal Heritage Act.